And of course, even now, at 51, 32 years into training, <laughs> I still haven't figured it all out, not even close, never will. Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 680, with today's guest, Andy Allen. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we're doing, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. And one of the things you'll find there is our store. And if you find something in the store that you like, make sure you use the code PODCAST15, get yourself 15% off, and let us know that this show has an impact on you. If you're willing to part with a few bucks, and says something about what we're doing. The show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We're bringing you two episodes each and every week. And the goal of the show, and really of Whistlekick overall, is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, you can do a number of things. You could make a purchase, like I mentioned before. You could share this or an episode with maybe somebody you train with. Or you could join our Patreon. If you think the new shows are worth 63 cents a piece, you could support us at five bucks a month. And actually, you can go as low as two dollars a month. Patreon.com slash whistlekick, and you're going to get access to exclusive content in certain tiers. You get merch like shirts and whatever it's just it's a a pretty valuable program and i'm making that statement based on the fact people rarely leave so go check it out and actually if you want the full list of all the things you can do to support whistlekick and our mission as well as a constantly shifting mix of just we'll just categorize it as fun stuff whistlekick.com slash family If you're someone who spends time on YouTube looking at martial arts videos, or if you're someone who enjoys the practical application of martial arts, there's a good chance that you know today's guest. Andy Allen's carved out a name for himself in this practical world, and I had the pleasure today to get to talk to him. He's a great guy, and we talk about not only how he started and things that you might expect, but what prompted a fairly sizable shift and the direction of his martial arts practice. Instead of me spoiling it or trying to summarize it, I'd rather let you hear the words from the man himself. So here's my conversation with Mr. Andy Allen. Hey, Andy, how are you? Hey, Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. So what's going on? Living the dream. (laughs) Yeah, I can relate. Yeah. well, I'm a high school teacher, and we're we're uh, doing online for at least this week. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the rationale was to um, give schools chance to, or the maintenance people, a chance to put HEPA filters in all the schools. Oh. Not sure why they're waiting two years in to do that, but here we are. <laughs> no comments. Yeah, <laughs> I have no comments. Okay, you're in. You're in Vermont, right? I am. I am. You're you're up north, aren't you? Where where are you? Which province? Northern north of you. I'm just in Nova Scotia. Okay. okay. It's, uh, north north to east. Yeah. Well, just across the Gulf from Maine. Yeah. Not that far as a crow flies. I don't know if I've ever been in Vermont. I think I was a long time ago when I was a teenager. For a weightlifting competition of all things. Oh, interesting. I used to do that in my youth. My father was Canadian champion back in the 60s. And uh, he kind of tricked me into joining. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was interesting. Like, he wouldn't uh, pressure to do things. But um, he just brought home a, a barbell one time in the basement with some weights and just left it there. And, of course, well, I, I was probably around 11 or 12 at the time. I looked to see what was going on. And I... I had seen um, pictures of of him weightlifting, and he was at the time coaching a guy who eventually won a medal at the Pan American Games. And that's why I go watch them work out. And so I was just doing what I thought I was supposed to do and making a mess of the course. And didn't say anything, just let me uh, do my thing, trying to impress my friends. And then um, eventually he started showing me some things and let me kind of 
chew on that for a while. Yeah. And the event, you know, I just, then after a while, I just started training. Nice. I never was any good at it because I, I just, my, my body physique was too long and, mm. and lean, all legs, which is great for kicking. <laughs> yeah. Not, not, not good when you're moving that weight overhead though. Oh, no. So I was, uh, I went, we have a, I don't know if, if you have a, an American equivalent, we have this thing for uh, youth amateur sport, the Canada Games. So I think the age is uh, up to 21. And basically each province, what you call states, sends a team off in different sports and each province will take a turn hosting every four years. It's kind of like a mini Olympics kind of thing. So I nice. came second last at the Canada Games. <laughs> I went to the Canada Junior Cup in 80, I want to say somewhere in the 80s. And I think I came second last there as well. So I had sensational technique. I was very well coached, but absolutely no raw strength. Mm. I've got a bit of experience with weightlifting. You know, when, when most people use the term weightlifting, they're not talking about weightlifting. So as you, as you were talking, I, I had to shift shift parts of my brain as to what what it was you were talking about uh, i you know uh, i find a lot of synergy with martial arts because it's such technical movement and there's so much detail yeah. in there but it's uh takes a special kind of person to succeed yeah. in that sport yeah and uh, it is very technical. Like, so this is the Olympic style of weightlifting I'm talking about. Not mm -hmm. we, we would uh, turn our nose up at, at the powerlifters. So powerlifters would do bench, press, squat, and um, uh, what the heck else would they do? Bench, deadlift. Press, deadlift, yeah. yeah. Uh, we would do snatch and clean jerk. Mm -hmm. It's much more of a dynamic, explosive kind of thing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, deadlift, you just you, you need gorilla strength. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of to do it. Uh, and the same as bench press. But the the Olympic lifting is very, very technical. And that's the only way I was even remotely competitive at the provincial level was because I had great technique and great hip and ankle flexibility. I'd pull the bar up as high as I could go, which wasn't very high. Then I'd drop underneath it with my butt two inches from the floor. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, my my legs are too long, no leverage there. Um, but you know, I did it for quite a while. It was fun. And then I, I quit when I went... I was going off to university and there was no place to train in the city, oddly enough. And that's when I discovered karate well, in my first year at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Interesting. You may be the first person we've had on the show who has that story, you know, plenty, plenty of sports, you know, if we consider weightlifting sport in that general sense, not an uncommon story, but I've got, I mean, we, we probably have dozens of people who have gone the other direction you know, started martial arts and found some synergy with weightlifting, especially the power generation aspect and pulling that back in to improve their game, so to speak. Yeah. I have a, a place in my backyard. I, two, no, three years ago, two years ago, I built this shed. Well, I call it a shed. It's good size though. And I made it really pretty. I call it the karate cabin now. It's 16 by 20. It was originally supposed to be a storage shed for the lawn tractor and snowblower, that kind of stuff, right? Um, but then COVID 2020 hit, and I'm I'm home. I, I have a, a credit course I teach in high school in martial arts. And I need a place to, to teach from. And so I turned the shed into a dojo. It, it wasn't insulated at the time. So it was a bit chilly. So I had to dress warmly. But it's now insulated. I just I have uh, mats out there. I have a quarter inch rubber mat down and then 40 millimeter mats on top of it. So it's actually pretty nice. I just need to put something on the walls to cover up the insulation. But I go out there with some weights once in a while. I just have some dumbbells. I don't have like a, a barbell. So I have a bag out there. I'll go beat that around for a while, lift some weights. So just, you know, as we get older, it's kind of your, your muscle mass starts to deteriorate so i'm trying to prevent that prevent the inevitable yeah yeah so you know you you go to university and you're not weightlifting because there's no gym but i'm sure martial arts wasn't the only thing karate wasn't the only thing available to you what what made you choose that well truthfully it's just by fluke um so the big sports complex on campus 
Yeah, so the Dowplex was the like the gym area at the time mm-hmm. on campus, and uh, so I did my phys ed degree, and we did a lot of the courses in the sports facility. And there's just a flyer posted because it's pre-internet days, no websites, and uh, beginner karate classes. So I saw the sign, and my buddy who was in my class with me, he was uh, playing some high-level hockey. We decided to go. Both went to first class, liked it. And he never went back again. He's just too busy with hockey. But uh, I went back and just kind of immersed myself in it as much as I could. And that was in January 1990, 32 years ago this month. Uh Do you remember why you liked it? (laughs) I don't know. It's, It's funny because in high school, I had this friend and he was doing... So it was, it was shorter can karate that I was taking. And, but back in high school, my friend was taking shorter can and I would make fun of him, of course. Right. And, and there I was two years later doing the same stuff within the same organization he was training. In. Um, but I don't know. It was something totally different. I mean, I, I guess I, like a lot of guys, I grew up watching some Bruce Lee stuff and, um, a bit of Jackie Chan and, um, blood sport and that kind of stuff and and i just i I really just joined it on a whim but once i got in there it was i really found it interesting so i I didn't master everything of course but uh, the instructor said you're doing really well keep it up so that was motivating um and it was just something i had never had any experience before it was just fun to learn something new and the learning at the time seemed endless. Like you think you got one thing figured out mm-hmm. and there's something else to learn. And of course, even now at 51, 32 years into training, <laughs> I still haven't figured it all out. Not even close. Never will. No. Yeah. Right on. I would so, describe myself now yeah. as uh, an aging martial artist with regrets. Well, the aging part's obvious because none of us are getting any younger. It's right. a great Mitch Hedberg joke in there. <laughs> but the regrets. <laughs> Tell me what you mean by that. So I did enjoy Shotokan for a long, long time. And I learned a lot. I competed quite a bit uh, at the provincial level, at the national level, even did uh, as a senior, went to the Worlds in 2016. But there's this culture, right? And I don't mean to be critical to any of my instructors, but but just in general, in some of the big organizations like the one I belong to, there's this culture where you stay home, right? You, you stay within the walls of the organization and you're not really encouraged to branch out and explore other things. Mm-hmm. And so my understanding of martial arts or of karate, at least, was 3K karate. And I know some people might not understand that term 3K. So that that stands for kata kion kumite. So your kion is your movements in air, your basic movements, kicks, punches, blocks, that sort of thing. And kata, of course, is your forms, your pumse. Um, tol, tol, is that what you call it in some type of Yeah, pumse, yeah. tol, hyong. Yeah. yeah, patterns, whatever. And yeah. your kumite is your sparring. And uh, I mean, there's, many different kinds of sparring. Even in Shotokan, you get your step sparring, your semi-free and your free sparring. The regret part is regarding my me, me not branching out and exploring other types of martial arts because the skill set that you learn in Shotokan is very, very narrow. Uh, I learned how to hit someone or at least score a point from someone uh, from half a mile away. Right, this long range torment style of fighting. And um, like my, my sensei wasn't big on tournaments. We'd have a couple of year, but uh, when I was about 30, I, I wanted to get better. And I, I sought out this local guy. His name's Mitch German. I can never remember the style of karate he took. He, he does it's Shitru or Chitru. It's one or the other, but he was a world champion in his own right. Um, really incredibly skilled guy. So he taught me footwork and so he gave me another learning curve, if you will, in the competitive part of karate. But in terms of close infighting, uh, I knew absolutely nothing. I knew nothing about grappling. Uh, I just knew how to punch and kick from mid to long range. And But because of this culture where you don't 
you don't um, uh, you're not supposed to be going exploring other martial arts. I just took that as the way it was, and I stayed put. I stayed home, if you will, just with Shotokan. And um, yes, yeah, so that's my regret because so, so I've been kind of uh, dabbling in jujitsu off and on for the past oh three and a half ish years. Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit of judo discovered that at the time when I was 45 that was way too old to take up getting slammed to the earth um, yeah it's definitely a young man's game I, you know I had some good teachers and they were a lot of fun and I learned a lot uh, in the short time that I was there but I, I just had to tell him uh, Sean Golding was one of the senseis I said look I, I love the class I love the dojo it's a great vibe I just can't do it <laughs> I get, the throwing part's fun but I get out of my truck when I get home. I can't move. I can't walk operate anymore. Mm. Uh, so I had to give it up. So, I, you know, it, to be an older person at at the time, 45, who had been training, let's say, for 20 years, that's a different thing than someone learning that art at 45. Because, um, you, you know, you make fewer mistakes. You just don't get thrown around as much if you're a black belt. So it's both sure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, I, I really wish I had branched out a long time ago in something um now back in the early 90s in halifax uh taekwondo was getting big because that was shortly after the seoul olympics right i had no interest in that um especially the like the the, the olympic style just not something i was interested in mm-hmm. there's a kempo karate but for some reason they were the quote-unquote bad guys you weren't supposed to go there um i think if i wanted to do judo that would have been acceptable because it was Japanese. Strange, eh? Um, Jiu-Jitsu wasn't a thing because UFC didn't come around until, what, 93, I think? UFC 1, I think, was 92. It was 92 or 93. But, you know, it still took a long time for BJJ to spread. Yeah, especially in in my part of Canada. uh, You know, it's it's smaller. The the biggest city's not that big. and It's not like Toronto or Montreal, but probably appeared much earlier um so this wasn't a lot of options um and, but even in the karate world there were certain people that you were not supposed to go to i i can remember this um one japanese master who was i think he had been living in canada for quite a while but he was doing a clinic and we were told do not go there hmm. and i i didn't know why i just said and, and you you agree to what you're told to do and not do um and but that was the thing. Like you just kind of stay within your little bubble. I call it the the Shotokan bubble. But likewise, it, it could be a Taekwondo bubble or the uh, the Kempo bubble. I don't you know. Um, but I, I just uh, I, I still do some jujitsu. I love it. Um, I but progress is slow when you're injured all the time. Right. I, I had just taken some time off. My ribs are kind of beat up actually from taking a knee in the ribs. But then when in jujitsu, someone's 210 pounds and rolling on you, it just doesn't feel good. It's getting, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it does okay. not. I, I'm not small, but I'm not big. I'm 100 pounds, 170 pounds. So, uh, so when you get someone who's got uh, 40 pounds on you um, and the generally they're on top of me all the time, uh, it, it just it just it just hurts. Um, but it's and you know when you're rolling with a, a young guy who's 25 you can tell him okay just be careful my ribs and my left elbow and my my big toe <laughs> you can go down the list right of all the things to avoid and say okay good 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 but they don't really get it what it feels like to be 50 plus years old mm. they don't understand that if they get hurt you know they're good to go in a week if, if i get hurt uh i'm off for quite a while but you know, it is what it is. I go, I go as much as I can, um, on top of teaching a couple times a week. But um, the, the the cool thing is, even in the jujitsu club I go to now, there's the stuff that we do. I say, like, hey, that's this kata, uh, that's that kata, and like if you look at a figure four position with your legs, where you're with your foot hooked behind the other knee, uh, the knee of your other leg. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a kata in Shotokan called gankaku, means crane on a rock, or uh, I think it's called chinto, the Okinawan version. I think it's what it's called. 
And it's basically you're standing on one leg with your hands in this one hand's high, one hand's low. Uh, but the, the foot position, that's a figure four. And there's all kinds of applications for that. Triangle jokes, heel hooks, uh, it, it's endless. Um, so there's all, all kinds. Now, whether that's what it originally meant when the creator of the kata made that, who knows? But it's undeniable, a figure four of some kind. So it's cool to see movements and positions in jiu-jitsu. There's also, uh, you probably, is it Taekwondo that you do? I've done a wide variety of things. Okay. Taekwondo is on the list. Well, I think in any form-based martial art, you have what's often called an X block. Mm -hmm. Your hands might be high, your hands may be low, but your wrists are crossed. And that can be, I interpret that as a figure four with your with your hands, your arms. Um, or a double wrist lock is a submission wrestler would call it. Uh, like if you're doing a Kimura lock. But anyway, this, this position is in all kinds of kappas, and you use it endlessly in grap. Uh, whether it be uh, get a grip on a leg or get a grip on a um, an arm or even some chokes, your hands are crossed. That's in kappa. And there's a something called a gift wrap choke. I'm gonna. I have a video I shot. I haven't released it from my YouTube channel yet. Um, the gift wrap choke. You basically get your, your partner's arm wrapped around the neck and you 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 pull it tight and then you, you ram your your uh, your fist between their forearm and their neck. And you move in a certain way, it, it hurts like hell, or you can choke them. <laughs> and it, it's, and if you have your knee on their belly, it's exactly like gunkaku, where you drop to one knee and you cross your hands down in front of your waist. It's, it's right from the kappa. So it's cool to see the, the relationship between grappling arts and kappa, because a lot of people, well, when I was going through shoulder camp for so many years, kappa was something to do to make look good. And all of your gradings were based, for the most part, on looking good. Uh, so you do your kino, your kicks and your punches in air, just so. You do your kata, fast and snappy, sharp movements, good stances and so on, good posture. And you do your, when you, when you get up to black belt level, your gradings involved, free sparring. Um, but there was never any mention of uh, real, realistic applications of kata. It was just, it's um, something for movement learn general body movements without any understanding of the applications. And the applications that I learned from Shotokan masters were, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, were absolute rubbish. Uh, and that's being nice, really. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, someone starts from a, well, you have four people surrounding you. And the person on your left starts in a down block position and they do a stepping punch. And they conveniently don't penetrate to hit you in the ribs. So you step forward and hit block them. And then they step back as you get to give you room to do your counterattack. So you can do your cut the movements, right? Um, and it's just it, none of the applications I learned years ago are based on any kind of reality whatsoever. It's just, it's just silly. Uh, but when I started seeing some real bunkai or now I, like many people, I misuse that term. Oyo is the application of kata. The, the Japanese term bunkai is the analysis of right now, but I'll just call it bunkai. So Ian Abernathy, uh, and with his organization now, um, he, back in the early 2010s, around 2013, I, I saw some of his work out, and it was he and Godan. And like, that makes sense. That funny movement is, uh, uh, what do you call it in judo? Sanagi, or Ipon Sanagi version of it. That makes sense. An opening movement of Hien Godan or Pinan Godan. Someone's grabbing you, smash their arm, you smash them in the, the neck with your so-called inside block. Uh, you crank on their shoulder. That makes sense. That's real. Not the nonsense that I had learned before. So, yeah, regrets in not branching out to other martial arts. Regrets for not uh, exploring practical karate. So all I had learned where in, it was at all practical was point fighting. You know, I came, became pretty decent at it, um, but point fighting, it is what it is, right? You're, so in the, 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 the fighting I did to score, now the rules said no contact, but really there was some. Uh, and at, a, at least the national level when I was competing, really, you, you slam your fist in the guy's gut fairly hard because if 
He's any kind of athlete. He can take it. But you'd hit them in the muscles on purpose. So you can slam it in and make it kind of a thud. Mm-hmm. If you're in the solar plexus, they doubled over. Maybe you get a warning to the point. Uh, so you kind of play the game, right? Same with a kick. You don't kick him a roundhouse kick in the ribs. If you can kind of shift that angle, whale in the stomach where they can take it and make the sound, you get a point, not a penalty. Um, but you can't really kind of fake that to the head. If you hit them hard, you hit the heart of the head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but there's all kinds of things with i mean what i learned that i would deem as valuable from port Sparm is the ability to manipulate distance right to get in and get out which you have seen leo the machita do very successfully yeah he's on, right uh he's kind of staying a perimeter boom boom in and out hit you three times and he's gone uh so that's the kind of fighting i did and that's what i what i learned but I was completely clueless, you know, within grabbing distance. And it's mostly from uh, doing Kata Bunkai that I got a, a pretty good base with that, doing drills that Ebernethy had made, uh, Patrick McCarthy. Um, and then I started making my own as well. Um, yeah, so I don't have a, like a super colorful past. It's basically been Shotokan, uh, some Jiu Jitsu tiny bit of judo and train with some practical karate guys but it's a it's a journey one way or another yeah it 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 certainly is wherever we are wherever we're going there's a path in between and whether it's colorful or not it is ours yeah yeah and you know the the path that we take there's uh, more than one path top the mountain and Mm -hmm. some paths might be more short and direct others are kind of winding you go up and down and sideways and so on and um but uh yeah the, the i guess the main thing is keep moving forward keep learning so I, I gotta ask because i wear a few different hats in my role here when i talk to guests and one of them is trying to anticipate questions that the audience may have and one of them that I, i'm curious you're speaking about let's call it your your martial arts origins and as you said regrets is it possible you're painting Shotokan with a broad brush when maybe the responsibility lies with your instructors? That's a great question. And I would say that the interactions I've had with people online, uh, some people have made comments to that, to that effect, right? Um, they say, well, my sensei taught us throws. Uh, my sensei this. Then you find out, well, their sensei is also black belt in judo. Uh, so I, I think, but, but I've also trained with many, many people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was with the ISK. I, I, I left two years ago. Um, I can talk more about that later. But we we used to be part of the JKA, but then of course, as happens in, in karate, there's all kinds of politics in the eyes <laughs> yeah. left the JKA. But but whether I was with the JKA years ago or or just the ISKF, like we were the America's branch of the JKA basically. But I trained with a number of different different people, a lot of different Japanese masters, and you know the I gotta be honest, the approach was the same kind of thing. It's a uh, kion. So you do your basic forms and your thunderous ki eyes all moving in unison. It's kind of cool, feels good, but not exactly the most practical training methodology. Your kata for the purpose of getting good at kata. And the kumite, um, you know, the, the free sparring was, was useful. The step sparring, not so much. But if you look at the curriculum, that's in different Shotokan organizations, whether it be the ISKF, the JKA, the SKIF, uh, WTKO, and you can go on and on and on. It's all, all 3K. Because I, I did some looking around one time because uh, I was wondering, is, it, is this just my experience or is this the Shotokan the way it is around the world? And everything I could find, it's you know with some different tweaks. Of course, the, the Keon combinations are going to be different for your sixth Q sure, for, sure. for Gupta and Taekwondo for, uh, for this organization, that organization, but it's all the same stuff. You're doing knife hand block, that kick to front leg, and you're doing 
a two punches, then a shift back, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the same kind of stuff that you're getting graded on. So I say it's up to the instructor to make it practical. Uh, so I wouldn't say it was the, just the fault of my instructors, per se, but I think that's the way Shotokan is. But some people are, are willing to or have the ability to bring in other elements. And they've done some, some Aikido, so they do some locking. They have done some Judo, so they do some throwing. They do some, or some, some groundwork, and there wasn't. Uh, and I would say that's very healthy to be able to um, teach your students in a well-rounded way, uh, which is what I do now, if you have the background to do so. Um, so I, I, to answer your question, I think Shotokan, it, it is what it is. And if you look at the grading syllabus, uh, what a person may or may not experience is that those other elements of martial arts, the different ranges of fighting or different tactics like throwing and locking that an individual instructor may or may not include based on their experience. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I had a feeling that's where you would go, but I didn't want to answer for you. So I figured I'd let yeah. you let you put into your words. <laughs> you are passionate about these elements within martial arts that you were almost deprived of. That's that's my reaction to what you've said. Yes. So I always like to flip things. What do you think might have been different? You know, we, we, we have some alternate reality where you were exposed to practical application. You know, you had found Ian's work earlier or someone similar to Ian. And this sort of, of education was part of the curriculum you had early on, what would be different now today? Well, if that was the case, I probably would still be training in my old organization. Mm -hmm. um, because, see, it was a long time ago. So I was 19 years old when I started training. And I can remember doing the steps burning. And you did the same kind of thing in, in Taekwondo. It might look a bit different, but basically, the way we did it, someone the defender, if you will, is standing. The attacker steps back in a, in a down block position. They announce their attack and they move forward with either one, two, one or three attacks. It might be a kick, might be a punch, whatever. And you, you block it and you counterattack it. And I, and I so in, in Shotokan curriculum, in the ISKF, when I went through the, the color belt ranks, um, you would do that up until, uh, the high level end of brown belt. And then for your first dan, you do what's called semi free sparring, which is just step sparring from a fighting stance. Mm -hmm. And then you don't actually free spar for test purposes until you're going for your second dan. Uh, so it, it wasn't long before I, I started to kind of question, even with my limited exposure to other martial arts, uh, my, I just, I, I did, I'd ask myself, is this practical? Is this, does this make sense? But I didn't have the answer because I didn't have anything to compare it to mm -hmm. because I was in my bubble and you were supposed to branch out, right? So, uh, I, I think if early on, if there's no steps for our and say, okay, here, here's the end short on the first, the first, uh, the kata. If we we're doing some of the things that I teach now, where you strip an arm away, I'll find an angle, you smash them in the head, you grab them by the chin, you bump them, you throw their face to the floor, you do a hammer fist strike. That's the first four movements of hand show down. That's what it means or what it can mean. That would have made sense. And that would have um, uh, made me stay, I guess. Right? Uh, huh. I wouldn't have had all those questions because, so, the, and, and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, this wasn't that long ago. So within the ISGF, I might get myself in trouble, but we're back. Um, there is a technical committee on it for one particular geographical area within the organization. And they had put together a document, which I had to, uh, I was privy to because, at the, you know, I was, this is kind of later on and I was fairly high rank, right? So my sensei showed it with me and 
it was basically a document moving towards the standardization of kata because I, I can do uh, a particular kata and someone else from the West Coast do it differently and then someone in a different organization. There's a different little flares to it, right? So the, the, the aim was to standardize the movements and how they're executed, which is fine. I have no issue with that. Uh, because there's all kinds of versions out there. And within an organization, maybe you want some consistency. And the ISKF was growing after the split, and we had uh, adopted some other countries from from different parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> so it basically said that they were going to use the Nakayama's books, best karate series, as the standard uh, for how to do the techniques, except for these kind of exceptions. And, you know, they said, so in, in this kata, we're going to do it this way. We're in this kata, movement 14, will be done this way. All good, fine. But in the, and this is when I was in the process of, I, I had opened my, my current dojo, which was 2016. And I was trying to balance 3K karate and practical karate. I was trying to teach Real practical applications to, to kata, do some throwing, a little bit of groundwork. I was trying to teach um, things that would work, right? But I also had, I was still using the 3K testing syllabus to advance my students. And so the, the you know, the time would come to test. And, um, my sensei is all right, test in November. So I, I take my students that were kind of getting ready. It's all right, we're going to work on one of the Ks tonight. Then we'll do practical karate. And the next night we'll do another K, then we'll do practical karate. And it was getting really hard to balance the two. They're two different animals. And I, I was having difficulty admitting to myself that these two approaches to karate were colliding and they were not complementing each other. Mm. So I was having some hang-ups about my original intent of opening my dojo to, to, to blend the two. So back to this document, the, in the introductory section of the document, it acknowledged that uh, uh, there's all kinds of um, uh, people and resources out there showing self-defense applications of, of kata. I can't remember how exactly it phrased, but it's, it's talking about the Ian Abernathy kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, but for the purposes of the ISKF, kata will be for development of body movement. That's what it said in a nutshell. In other words, the bunkai we see on YouTube now is all good, but we ain't going to do that. We're going to just do kata to make it pretty and move our bodies. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I was. I was really disappointed because I knew that there was absolutely no hope for the organization to change away from its the status quo. And and I'm not, not just dumping on the ISKF, but I think even the JKA, uh, the big ones, their their mandate is self preservation, and they they have to make sure. That they continue to survive, and if you if you discourage your members from going elsewhere and exploring and growing, then they don't see that necessarily, and uh, they're less likely to question and more likely to accept the status quo instead of growing. Yeah, um, so that that was a bit of a disappointment for me, and that was gave me one more reason to leave my organization so and, and my my instructor my sensei he he's vice president now i think he was at the time as well so he had a a voice right so i would do these videos for my youtube channel i do a a, a head crank neck crank kind of application or a joint lock kind of application or a choke or whatever and I would typically share my videos with him. And uh, he, he, for the most part, supported what I was trying to do and finding the practicality in karate and 
or or to go back to the old ways, right? Hmm. Anko Chishim started the old to understand the new. So Shotokan is relatively modern martial art, but it's lost its roots, essentially. I'm trying to find the roots. So my lawyer was both my lawyer, sorry, my, my sensei, who was a lawyer. He's both <laughs> uh but there's a point that he, he would he tends to look through at the world through the lens of legalities, right? Um and so he's uh cautious um about putting yourself in a position where you're gonna be uh at risk. So I I sent him one particular video and it's the the cut was called Nijushiro. And basically it was a, a snap down of the neck. Um like a, a wrestler might kind of have kind of a collar tie and, and have a sharp pull down the back of the neck. This is more like a chop to like a ridge hand strike to the chop of the, of the back of the neck. You snap it down and then I would do a, what I call a bicep bump. So you, you punch beside the head when they're kind of bent over and you hit them with your bicep. You can't really practice because it, just, it hurts too much. You give them a concussion. Then you wrap your arm around the neck and choke them out. And so he looked at that, that's, but he was a little bit worried about me putting myself uh, in a position where somebody might want to sue me, I guess. But my response is, well, like if, if someone wants to learn how to do a guillotine choke, they're not going to look at me, karate guy. They're, they're going to look at one of the 10,000 YouTube videos out there, right, on how to do a guillotine choke. It's just yeah. it's so ubiquitous. You, you, you're not going to, no one's going to single out my video and say, you know, I, I try a guillotine choke and I hurt someone. Let's do Andy Allen. Uh, so, but, you know, he's just trying to protect me. So I understand that. But that, that was another reason why I, I considered uh, maybe it's time for me to move on. So in January 2020, right before COVID, I had already been writing my curriculum, had been talking to Ian Abernethy uh, about joining the World Combat Association, the WCA. And I had to write my own curriculum under certain very broad guidelines. Basically, you have to have a bunch of things that you're covering. And so at this point, I had finished my curriculum, I had been approved the WCA, I told my sensei, and he said, you know, I, I knew you were going to leave. <laughs> I was I was worried about what he was going to think, right? He's going to be disappointed, but he said, yeah, just it's just going to be a matter of time before you, you get up and left. And, you know, he said, but you always have a, a home here. Anytime I come back to train, um, you're more than welcome to. And I would I would teach a lot of classes for him, right? I just, once I started my own club, I would show up less and less. But I'd show up and say, hey, you want to teach tonight? Said, okay. <laughs> um, but the the students there uh, were typically an older crowd. And, you know, they're they're into karate just for fitness. Mm-hmm. And because the dynamics of the club changed drastically from when I started in 1990. There was, it was a, it's a university club. And it had a lot of university students. And we do some lot of sparring and stuff. Uh, but over the years, it became very different. You get a lot of 50, 60 year olds who had just been trained for a year or two or a few months, and it just became Kata and, and, and Kion. And so I'm trying to do these things with these people, and he's he's worried, right? Because, and some of the older ones, they just step out and, oh, my neck's too bad, or oh, my back's too bad, because they're, they're not in it to learn how to fight. But um, the things I would show people, uh, my sensei liked them. And the, my fellow students like them because it gave meaning to kata. What are they, my, my own ideas of things I had learned from Ian or other people, McCarthy and so on. Um, so, yeah, so I left in January 2020, but then, you know, ready to go full steam ahead, but then COVID hits and everything shuts down. Let's, let's talk about YouTube. Let's talk about where... Where the desire to not only explore this but share this side of the martial arts originated for you? Um, you know, it, it, again, I didn't have any kind of grandiose ambitions for it, uh, but uh, I think I just checked today. Now it's pretty modest. The, the number of subs I have is close to four thousand. I'm not making any real money off it. But it's a fun to do. But I, I started off just as a you know a little pet project, and I, I started out when I was opening my dojo, and just as a you know to have a bank of resources, if nothing else, for for the students. Say, and I started off uh, 
just kind of tweaking some of Ian's drills. And I had trained with him down in New Jersey for the first time in 2016. And I spoke to him, hey, you know, I'm, I want to do some videos. I'm thinking of doing, if I do some of yours, we give you credit. Is that okay? Said, yeah, 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 absolutely. Ian's an awesome guy. So yeah, yes. my, my first few were based on his work for the most part, and some of them still are. And then as I learned more, I became more creative and got my own. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it just started off with, you know, I'd have 30 subs. You know, and I was so excited the day I got 100 subs. And then Ian shared one of my videos one time, and, and you can track your metrics through the YouTube studio. And, it, it, you know, relatively speaking, my views exploded. Mm -hmm. subs. Um, but, yeah, I never really started it to make a name for myself, if I've even done that yet. I don't know. Uh, but it's just, it, it was kind of a, a fun journey. I'm still going through it. And I guess... It, it, to some extent, it's a way to kind of, um, it helps keep me motivated to keep growing as I have new ideas. I sit down, I edit some footage, I put it out there. And it's, it's, for me, it's a way to track my learning, to track my progress, track my journey. And I think it's just a good idea to, to share that with people. And a lot of people find it helpful and like to see a, a Shotokan person doing something practical. Of course, I have my haters out there too. Um, they, they're they very quick. Some of them say, that's not Shotokan. And eventually I had to start saying, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's applied Shotokan. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, if, if the way I see it, if, um, and there's one video I want to to, to film someday, it's, it, it's basically, it's a Muay Thai technique. You catch a round kick, you lift their leg up, pull the head down, shoot the leg out. It's right from kata. Mm -hmm. uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so you're, it's that one-legged stance I'm talking about with your with your foot behind your 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 knee. Um, yeah, so if if I whether it's from you know quote unquote from Muay Thai or from Jiu Jitsu or whatever, if I can show that it's in kata, it's a shorter can kata, it's short can, or at least it's it's karate. And some people will say yeah, that's not karate. Well. Not the karate that you know, it is the karate I know. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the the YouTube channels, it's, it's kind of fun. I, I'm a bit of a, a geek. I, I just enjoy the process of sitting down and editing footage. I don't know why I, I like that. I, I like tracking the YouTube metrics. I like the graph going yeah. up and down. Up and to the right. Yeah. As long as <laughs> yeah, it's not down into the right, you're, you're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that happens sometimes. As soon as you get inactive, uh, you see things start to plummet. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so during COVID 2020, especially, I, I, I do in all my classes, it's this high school class I teach. Uh, I would film the workouts and just because everyone around the world is all locked down. So I figured I may as well share some of the stuff. And so I would just uh, have a 15 minute hit workout or a 30 minute karate workout. And I just put it up on YouTube and people message me from, from Germany and from, uh, from the States and from the UK and said, this is fantastic. I had nothing to do this weekend. Now I get myself a workout. Um, so whether it be a workout or, or uh, something simple, it could be something pad drill. I get comments. People are seem to be liking it. So I'll just keep doing it. What's keeping you motivated? And, and and let me let me put a put a, some subtext on that question. Teaching is hard work. Stepping into the internet and creating content that you know a portion of the viewership will find fault with and has no problem tearing you down for it uh, can be tiring, exhausting, depressing, even. And you're choosing to do these things. Yeah. Um... Why? I admit there's some days I, I ask myself, why the hell do I even bother putting this stuff online? Because the, the trolls, they come out in droves, right? Sure. And yeah, you know, I'll, I'll admit I, I enjoy much, way more positive feedback than trolling. Um, but we also have to be cognizant of who's watching our stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So it's mostly karate people watch my stuff. Uh or Taekwondo people, or whatever. It's not the jujitsu crowd, um, and they're brutally honest. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so yeah, there's all kinds of reasons not to do it, but I, I guess for one, um, that positive comment that you'll get from someone, uh, that keeps me going. Um, the, the, the drive to want to study and learn more that keeps me going. Um, and I want to be able to do as much as I can while I can, uh, as we were discussing earlier, getting old is no fun. And, you know, I, high kicks, they're just too much work and too much pain now. I do, so I do low kicks. Um, grappling is fun, but I have to play carefully. And, but, but I can still train in jujitsu and, and play in a dojo and still learn and experiment and tweak. And I can still do that, do that at 51. But, you know, uh, everyone's body has a shelf life and it just gets harder and harder to to train martial arts in a practical way before your body wears out and so i'm trying to get as much done as i can before i completely fall apart <laughs> mm. yeah yeah get that uh, you use the word play and that's mm. been a little bit of a recurring arc on this show the the selection of the verb with which you apply your martial arts. Are you training? Are you practicing? Are you whatever? I like the word playing. It, it, it sounds a bit disparaging at times, but it, I didn't hear any of that in, in the way you said it. Is, is that the word you choose? I think that's the word I choose now. When I was 25, I probably wouldn't use the word play when I was doing my sparring. Um, when I was 25, it was more about win, mm. right? Whether we're just in the dojo sparring with some I've been trained with for years, uh, I want to make sure I get more punches and kicks in on him than he does me um, because I'm a competitive person by nature. Yeah. But uh, like now, uh, for me to do the quote unquote karate sparring, punch kick stuff, uh, you know, I, my, my explosiveness is gone, right? I just, I just, knees hurt, toes hurt, hips hurt. I just, I, just, I can't go hard like I used to. Uh, even if I take the time to warm up, I'm not going to be able to walk properly the next day. So it's more about playing than winning. And so I, I, I'd much rather just spar light half speed, three quarter speed, whatever that means. And, you know, take some kicks and give some kicks and just play and not worry about who's winning, but just enjoy it. And, but I think the word play can be that just having fun, but we learn by playing, whether we're children or whether we're adults and playing can also mean experimenting. So when you're, when you're going, whether it be grappling kind of sparring or, punch kick kind of sparring or groundwork whatever if you approach it with a playful attitude uh so you both agree not to go 100 percent. you can try things that you know you probably wouldn't be able to pull off if you're going 100 percent and being competitive with each other right yeah. so there's there's certain things like when i was competing <laughs> uh to do a, a head kick around roundhouse kick I can count on one hand, I think the number of times I scored with that in all the years I competed, just because when you're competing at a national level and at an international level, it's just, I guess I just wasn't quite fast enough to get it pulled off on the guys who were good, right? So if someone's better than me, I'm going to stick to my bread and butter, the stuff I know I have the best chance of winning with. And, but you know, when you're in competition, you're not trying to learn, you're trying to win. But I, would, but I would bring that attitude, I suppose, for lack of a better word, into dojo. So me and my buddy are sparring, um, and I, I still want to get the better of him. I'm still got, I still have that competitive thing. I don't want to try something I'm working on uh, against someone who's as good as me in case it doesn't work. I know that makes absolutely no sense. But, but when I was young, I was just too damn competitive, and I was too worried about uh, not being the best. Um, which is silly when I say it out loud now. Yeah, but that, that's, I think, a fairly universal experience that 
not all of us grow past. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's the aging martial arts part, right? Aside yeah. from the eight veins and the tendonitis and stuff, it's the, it's the maturity. Hopefully. Yeah. Doesn't, and, doesn't always come through with age. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of us are slower to learn than others. So if True. I'm starting with, I, most of my students I have are, are teens. And if I have someone who's, uh, I've got one guy, he's only yellow belt. He's, he's been trained for about a year. Um, and he, he's, if, if he could train more, he'd be really, really good. Uh, but he's flexible. He's pretty quick. You know, so he, on, on his feet, that's the karate star, and he's pretty good. Um, so when we're playing, I, anyway, I, I doll it down even um, from what I'm able to do now. I have to doll it down a lot. Otherwise, it just gets overwhelmed, of course. Mm. But I'll, I'll doll it down to the point where he's probably not going to get any punches or kicks in, but he's able to try and able to almost get there, right? So for me, that and, and it has to be enjoyable and beneficial for him in order for him to learn. If I crank it up to 100%, you know, I'm going to kick him in the leg, I'm going to speak, I'm going to kick him in the head uh, once my hips get warmed up. And But that's just no fun for him. So right. it's play. And I don't, you know, if he gets a punch in, I don't worry about it too much. Uh, whereas before, with, you know, years ago, um, I would be very cautious about letting myself get open and just be competitive. Maybe not going 100%, but being reserved on what I'm going to do in terms of techniques and strategies and things I'm going to be best at. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not alone not alone in in what you're presenting and we've we've heard that on the show a, a number of times from a number of folks and it's yeah it's that analogy of the mountain that you used earlier mm. right? like there there are so many different ways to get there but not only are we all headed in roughly the same direction whether we realize it or not but i think and, and and you added a piece to this analogy for me today that I hadn't considered. The idea of some paths being more meandering than others means there's going to be some overlap. Yeah, you're going to cross sure. paths with other people at certain times. And my hope is that as as time passes, we all collectively get better at realizing that we're on the same mountain. We're headed for more or less the same goals. You know, we're all yeah. just trying to get better at whatever the parts are that resonate for us. Yeah. When I'm at my jujitsu club, um, there's this one fellow. He's, he's a very large personality. He's a blue belt. Uh, his name is Eric. And he's just full of life. And it's a lot of fun uh, playing with him because yeah, I know he dials it way down for me, right? I'm just I'm still a, a white belt. And he's been trained a lot more in the grappling arts than I am. Um, he did some judo and he, he's, I don't know how long he's been doing judo or jiu-jitsu. Probably four years, I'm guessing. Um, but he dials it down and lets me play. But he makes, he makes it sure. Nope, not getting that choke. Uh, nope, not getting that speed. And, but he'll let me, like, and he'll stop it. So it's a, let's say we're working on an omoplata. It's like a shoulder lock using your legs. Uh, he'll, kind of get in a position, see if I'll recognize it, and then I'll go for it, and then he'll take it away. Mm. But it, it, it's a really great way to learn for me, and it, it's for me as an instructor, too, it's a good takeaway. So he's given me opportunity opportunities to practice what we had done that class from previous classes, to recognize it or to flow from one position to another position, while at the same time... Uh, making sure I had to work for it and taking away the opportunity at the last possible second. Uh, it's a really, really fun way to, to roll. Uh, it is that, that playful approach. And then when he wants to turn it on, then I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there is, there is nothing better. You know, you're, you're kind of talking about it from both sides now. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing better or I, I think there's nothing more enjoyable than training with someone when you can suspend ego, regardless of the delta between skill levels. Yeah. yeah. If I'm working with someone who is 
has much less experience than I do, I can have a lot of fun because of what you just described with, with this blue belt, putting them in positions and, and trying to help them see what's going on. If I'm working with someone who has a great deal of skill more than I do, I, I can't help but learn in that environment. Yeah. And if I'm working with someone of similar skill, well, we're, we're both constantly challenging each other and benefiting from the use of the other's body. And I, you know, all, all three scenarios, I think, are, are phenomenal. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, martial arts, it should be about learning, right? Whether you're instructor, and, and, and as an aside, it's important to admit that we have things left to learn. Um, or whether you're a beginner, there's there's a, a learning path, and that's that always should be our goal. And for an instructor who's been around for a long time, I mean, I wish... I knew now, uh, when I was 25, I wish I knew what I know now. Sure. Um, I don't have the speed and explosiveness and the strength that I used to, obviously, but I, I just know a whole lot more. My, my, mount, my, my bucket of knowledge is exponentially larger just with all, all the, the, the benefits youth has brings to the picture, right? Right. But then that, that brings the, the old saying, youth is wasted on the young. If, if you'd had all that knowledge, yeah. would you have explored all of it? Or would, uh, would you, as I expect I did, uh, only use those things that, you know, made me feel good about myself? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, if I was 25 now and I could look into my future, uh, about what I was going to be missing, I think I definitely would have chosen mm. to not quit Shotokan, but to branch out, yeah. explore. Yeah. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with kind of having a, I think, I think if, uh, I don't know, if you kind of stay in martial art for a year, then quit that and go another one and go another one. Um, I, I suppose there are some benefits to that. But I, perhaps it's best to have kind of your base martial art and supplement that with with some other experiences, right? I, I think in most cases that's true. Yeah. So let, let's let's expand on on the hypothetical of you talking to your past self or in the past talking to your future your future self. If there is someone who is in their twenties or their late teens listening, and you know they're probably not even fully aware of how much ego drives what they do, mm. right? If you would ask me at 25 how much ego I had, I, I would have said, oh, very little. But in contrast to now, I, I was immensely ego-driven. Yeah, I think... Well, what would you tell right. those folks? Well, sometimes it's hard to talk to young people because they know everything, right? <laughs> uh, you know that from experience. Um, yes. I think as young people, uh, we don't know what we don't know. Mm, one of my favorite sayings. Right. Um, so when I was 25, uh, you know, I was, I was decent at what I was doing, but I didn't know what the heck else was out there. So if I could go back and talk to my young self, I'd say, look, here's what you can do with karate. Here's a whole world of the grappling arts that you're missing out on. Um, keep doing what you're doing but but supplement that uh understand that your skill set you're developing is it is what it is it's very very narrow um whereas you're learning how to strike from mid to long range um try some some groundwork because you know even even my 51 year old self if i'd say you know, for what I have for for ground fighting abilities, uh, let's let's fight on the ground. Let's go, and I, I kicked my twenty five year old ass any day because he didn't know anything. He was absolutely clueless. Uh, not to say I'm an accomplished ground fighter by any stretch of imagination, but you can be the best puncher kicker in the world. But if you've never grappled on the ground, you just have no idea what to do. You just don't. So I, it'd be it'd be fun to go show myself what I was missing and say, so if you want to be a well-rounded martial artist, go explore. 
He said, judo club down the other end of the city. Go join them. Mm-hmm. You learn how to throw. You learn how to fight on the ground. And that will make you more of a complete martial artist. The problem with that is if, uh, let's say, your goal as a young person is to be a good competitor in karate or in taekwondo, you need to, if you want to compete at the national or international level, you have to invest a lot of time in that. And you can't be dabbling in three different martial arts. You have to devote yourself to one. And in the, um, what do they call it? The WKF, the World Karate Federation, they have one of the, at the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got the competitors there, they're either only doing kata or kumite. They're sparring and not doing kata. Or they're doing kata for the sake of making a dance and not doing kumite. Because they don't have time if they want to compete at that level. Um, so I... I would tell myself there's more to martial arts than, than competition. Um, mm. Go learn something else. Learn a different skill set. And maybe you'll like it enough to make that your, your main martial art. Yeah, so, and also for the young people out there, uh, I was actually talking to uh, uh, one of the guys at Jiu Jitsu. He's, oh my God, he's 21 years old. I said, I have a son older than you. But <laughs> um, he's complaining about his shoulder. I said, don't, don't. <laughs> Your shoulder. <laughs> Let me like make you a list. Uh, but but yeah, that night I was. Um, I just told him, let's just go super light because I'm I'm kind of banged up. And he was really good about it. But I, I said, take care of your body. Go to some physio. Go to osteopath because that ish comes back to haunt you. <laughs> Believe me. And he said, yeah, I really should. Like, but don't just tell yourself like go get some treatment, get healed because jujitsu is really hard in the body. People are cranked on your shoulders and everything all the time. And if you don't care, take care of that when you're young, it's, it's going to be debilitating when you get old. Mm-hmm. Another young guy I was talking to ooh, a few years ago. Um, he was at a different jiu-jitsu gym, and he was talking to me about karate. And I said, you know, like, just go try all of it. Like, go try some judo. Try some karate. Try some uh, whatever you can get your hands on. Like, don't just stick to one thing. You're young, you're you're single, you have no kids. Like, <laughs> you have no idea how much life is going to change when you... Okay, this guy was really young. I think he's still in school. Uh, like, do things when you have the time and when you have the energy and life doesn't get you bogged down. Um, just, just go explore the world of martial arts. It's, it's a fun journey. But don't, you know, don't wait till you're an old man to do it. I sound like I'm... Some cranky old get off my lawn. <laughs> there, there, there is a, there is an element of that there, but that, <laughs> but I, but I, I, it's, it's the surface that is that, it, and you know, maybe it's because I'm not that far off you in age that I, I can relate, I can understand, you know, I, I think any of us who find things that we're really passionate about, there's an instinctive nature to want to rewind time and get to where we are faster because that gives us more time to do the thing or the things that we love so much. And, then, and that's, I think that's just human nature to, to want that. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. How can people find you? Um, YouTube applied short again. Uh, funny thing. Uh, I got called out a couple of times for the way I pronounce short again. Uh, a number of people have gone out of their way to spell it phonetically and it should be short I don't know why people feel the need to correct me on my dialect, but it is what it is. So applied Shoto Khan, uh, YouTube, uh, on Instagram, same thing, applied Shoto Khan, not Shoto Khan. And my blog site is kind of having some technical issues, but it's applied Shoto Khan.ca, CA for Canada. You know but, what? Anybody who gets bent out of shape about the way a thing is pronounced, or my right. favorite one is anything involving the English spelling of words that really are not English words. Right. You know, right? Like if, if I wrote down the word, if I wrote the word gi as like G-I-E, mm. when the generally accepted English spelling is G-I, people would lose their mind. Yeah. Yeah. Why? a waste of energy shut up and train yeah this guy that was uh calling me out on my pronunciation uh i think i replied 
this is last year. Um, if that's the only thing you find wrong with my video, I must be doing something right. <laughs> or more than likely, that person doesn't have anywhere close to the level of knowledge to even work on the stuff that you're giving yeah. him. And yeah. instead of him investing the time to get better, he finds a reason to dismiss what you say. Oh, if he can't even get the name right, this guy clearly doesn't know anything. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Uh, I I did a countdown, the top five videos from my YouTube channel. And I was... Uh, I posted them. Um, oh, I have a, a Facebook uh, group, Applied Shotokan by Andy Allen. You, you can pronounce it however you want. If you want to pronounce it <laughs> a, Applied Shotokan, I, I'm not going to sweat it. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Uh, Top five videos, Facebook. Group. Yeah. So it was one I filmed. It was last summer, and it was entitled "Is There Too Much Emphasis on Hip Rotation in Shorter Cam?" And I swear, some people didn't even watch the video. And, and all, all I was trying to say is, it, even as a black belt, I spent countless hours in a long front stance. Heels plant on the floor, feet not moving, rotate, 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 reverse punch, reset, reverse punch, reset, over and over and over and over, or he's at like a jab cross kind of thing, but with rooted in this long stance. Mm. Uh, like in the, you just drill, 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 rotate, more hips, more hips, more hips. But the whole point of the video was there are other ways to generate power, impact, other than hip rotation. Mm -hmm. It's important. But you move your mask forward. You can lean into it a little bit. You can show your, throw your shoulder into the punch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all, that was the point of the video. There's more than just hip rotation. And some people, all they could get away with is, what do you mean you have to have hip rotation? And so one person started criticizing my technique. And if he, he actually said something uh, to the effect that hard to take me seriously if I can't even pronounce Shota Khan correctly. <laughs> Oh my gosh! This this is on a different. This, someone had shared my video on a different Facebook page, and the trolls came out. You know, we we've managed to dodge a lot of that because you know very rarely are we saying anything ourselves. You know, we we will you know we put out content from other people, and because we are what I call style agnostic in our philosophy as a brand. You know, we're not putting out content that says this is how you do this or how you should do this or anything. So we, we've escaped quite a bit of it, which I am thankful for. But that doesn't mean we are without detractors. So I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And it can be so frustrating because there is a an inverse correlation between the amount of hate and the amount of skill. <laughs> yeah, I think that's often the case. The and, and if you say, well... Maybe you can show me a video, shoot a video for me, what you think this move means. Uh, radio silence. Oh, of course. Yeah. But haters hate. And, and you know what? Let's, let's be honest. It does help the algorithm. Yeah. There's some very <laughs> successful people out there, and the entirety of their business model is ticking people off. Yeah. And I can think of a certain celebrity boxer doing that right now. I, 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 made no implications about any any individuals and what they might pursue day to day but in in i think the case that you're talking about that guy's got more money than both of us put together yeah, yeah so maybe he's a smart one so yeah exactly. yeah meanwhile i'm going to work tomorrow <laughs> right well i appreciate you coming on yeah thanks, thanks for man. thanks for sharing your story and we always end with with the guest's words. So what do you want to tell the people listening? Martial arts is a wonderful journey. It's, uh, it's both broad and deep. Uh, there's so much to offer. Whether you have been doing something for 20 years, or you're just having thoughts about starting something, find a dojo, find a dojo, dojo, throw yourself in it, go learn, go have fun, become a better person, improve your body, improve your mind. Take in everything you can from as many people. Don't stay in one place. I think there's something to be said for looking back and understanding where we came from, why we did the things we did, because it tells us about who we are now and why we're doing what we're doing now. 
But I also think it's important to recognize that no matter what we did then, it was going to bring us to where we are now. And I think that we have a tendency as we age to look back. You know, Andy was talking about this. I, I have these same inner dialogues. Well, if I had found this sooner, if I had done this sooner, if I'd met this person earlier, and maybe you'd be further than you are now, I certainly could be further on my path than I am now. But would I ever be satisfied with that? And that was what I left this conversation thinking about this idea that I think if we're doing it, quote unquote, right, we're always going to want more. And there's a difference between being proud of the work that you've put in and the results that have come from it and feeling satisfied in a way that you stop. Hopefully those of you listening are the former, not the latter. And I'm sure that Andy falls into that first bucket for sure. Thanks for coming on the show. Had a good time and hope to get to talk to you again. Listeners, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes, all the stuff, and make sure you show Andy some love. Check out his YouTube page, and the other stuff that he's got going. If you're willing to support us here at Whistlekick and the work that we're doing, you have a few options. You might consider buying one of our Amazon books, telling others about the show, or supporting us at patreon.com slash whistlekick. Are you interested in having me come to your school? Put on a seminar? Let me know. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. The code podcast15 saves you 15% off something in the store at whistlekick.com. If you have suggestions, guests, feedback, anything like that, let us know. And of course, our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.